Hello, everyone. I'm Jackie Bloom, coordinator this year of graduate thesis here at SciArc. Um, welcome, everyone, to our second format lecture of the summer. Um, in case you're not familiar with this series, format lectures are put on by and for the graduate thesis program. And we offer it to the broader SciArc community. And today's lecture is live streamed and will eventually live on the grad thesis section of the SciArc channel. I'm super happy to welcome Bryony Roberts today. Bryony is a designer, a writer, and an academic teaching currently at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. She leads her practice, Bryony Roberts Studio, and is a founding member of WIP Co Collaborative. Bryony Roberts Studio has been awarded the Architectural League Prize and the AIA New York Prize for New Practices in New York. Bryony was also awarded the Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome in 2015 to 2016. Um, probably before anyone here might remember, Bryony taught an undergraduate studio here at SciArc, and I had the pleasure of teaching that studio uh, with Bryony. And since then, um, I, I've just been admiring your work from afar, um, your work, your scholarship, and really kind of fascinated by how you really connect design with the public realm and the way that you work um, and engage with uh, communities. So I, I'm just going to leave it up to you to share that work with us. Um, and thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much, Jackie. And it's so nice to be back at SciArc, even if remotely. Um, it's been a long time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you for such a generous introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen and just let me know if you have any trouble seeing it. Okay. Does that look all right? Great. That works. Um, so yeah, it's great to be back. And I just want to um, start off by saying also how much I've been impressed with the, the courage of the students at SciArc in, in recent months in advocating for, you know, equitable conditions, both within the school and also within the profession. Um, I'm seeing the situation only from the outside, but I know it's always difficult to speak up and to try to change the culture of this profession. Um, so I applaud and support your work. Um, so now on to talking about my practice. So um, as Jackie mentioned, I have a research and design practice based in New York, and we do projects across a wide range of scales and media. But the sort of uh, connecting theme is really the public realm. And in particular, looking at how the spatial aspects of the public realm are intertwined with the social conditions of a place, its cultural histories, its current social inequities, and the embodied sensory experiences of its communities. And in order to look at both those tangible and intangible aspects, I think it's necessary to expand the tools of practice beyond the familiar tools of architecture, so to pull from adjacent disciplines that offer different methods from, for addressing social experience, for example, work on intangible heritage in historic preservation, um, the lineage of social practice and community engagement, and also um, art practices that explore sensory effects and performance. So learning from all these different things, um, my practice does many different kinds of projects um, from collaborative performances, to architectural interventions and urban design projects, all of which aim to shift um, what is possible in the public realm. And the work really interrogates the idea of the public, that category of the public, um, asking who is supported and what behaviors are possible in public space. Um, we ask you know, who has included and excluded in the design of public spaces, and how have historical conditions of exclusion shaped the current public realm? And there's many people working on these themes, um, particularly from planning and policy perspectives, but I'm interested in, in approaching these questions, looking at the interplay of cultural histories 
and embodied experiences. So I think it's important to explore history and politics, not just at the level of analytical abstraction, but also at the level of individual everyday experience. And learning in particular from decades of work by intersectional feminists, my practice foregrounds embodied experience as a site of politics, where inequities are unconsciously carried and can also be resisted. So the work asks the question, how are the cultural histories of places entangled with embodied lived experiences? And how can design instigate alternative social and experiential conditions? So to address people's lived experiences, the process must be deeply collaborative from start to finish because no one person can speak for anyone else's experience. And I'm very aware of my own limitations as a privileged white cis straight woman, um, limitations in speaking for experiences of marginalization. So a lot of my work involves collaborating with self-advocates from marginalized communities, particularly with intersectional feminists, anti-racist and disability justice movements. And the work is a constant process for me working to be anti-racist, anti-ableist, to decenter myself and to elevate my collaborators. It's a process of honoring and celebrating the lived experiences of the people that I engage with. So the projects grow from many different processes of co-creation and collaboration with youth groups, with historians, with advocates, um, through recording oral histories, through making things together, mapping out performances, brainstorming new forms of public space, and during the pandemic, increasingly working on Miro as a shared whiteboard. I'm also through writing and research and editorial projects, exploring the sort of theoretical and historical dimensions of expanding the modes of practice to address, to address these intangible qualities of the public realm. And that included guest editing a recent issue of LOG, LOG 48, Expanding Modes of Practice, which included several SciArc faculty and alumni, um, such as Mira Henry and John Cooper, and also recent graduate Deborah Garcia. Um, so with that introduction, I will go into discussing a few projects, and I've sort of grouped them into three themes, historical sites, living histories, and sensory publics. And they all kind of are interconnected and really looking at that interplay between cultural histories and embodied publics. So the first cluster of work um, is on historical sites. And this actually emerged from my own thesis, my own master's thesis, uh, which was really looking at experimental forms of preservation, kind of challenging the idea that preservation is about freezing a place in time but instead about um, kind of embracing the constant transformation of historical sites to make them, um, to kind of address social change. So I did a series of projects, particularly um, early um, in my career that were responses to charged historical places, often sites of government or other authority. And it was an opportunity to have the starting point of a historical site kind of open this conversation about, you know, layers of cultural history, of political history, and also how that can connect to contemporary experiences. Um, so the projects sort of intentionally resist the known narratives or images of a place and instead introduce other forms of movement and social occupation. And several of these were done in collaboration, such as that second image, a collaboration with the South Shore Drill Team in Chicago, and the far right image, a collaboration with the choreographer Melissa Lohman in Rome. Um, and so building on these projects, um, I did a, a project for Exhibit Columbus in Columbus, Indiana called Soft Civic which was responding to the existing city hall building in Columbus, Indiana. And every year or every two years, Exhibit Columbus commissions these site-specific works that respond to specific buildings. Um, and I had already done several projects responding to sites of governance. Um, and I thought it would be productive to sort of go at this question of what is civic space and what are the possibilities of civic space? Intentionally trying to broaden the content of that space um, to include not only more political participation, but also play and performance and many ways of participating in the public. 
So this existing building, um, not super historical, designed or built in 1981 by um, SOM, um, is this very imposing government building. It's in a very small city, and it's one of the few buildings that's actually elevated off of the ground. Um, and so by, you know, these monumental steps. So it's quite imposing and distinct from the surrounding buildings. Um, that makes it a little bit less welcoming. Um, and typically the plaza in front of it is empty. Although there are occasionally moments of activation through political protests, um, performances and government ceremonies. Um, and so in figuring out how this could really be a more dynamic civic space, I spoke with the people who organized these kinds of activations and particularly the group Bartholomew County Indivisible, which is a kind of progressive political group that organized the protests, such as the one on the left. And I was asking them, you know, how can this space better serve political participation and also performance and play? And what I heard from them um, was that there were sort of two main ways to use the space, either facing outward for these grand events or these sort of smaller scale gatherings. And it's interesting how the form of the building, which is a very kind of strong geometry, this, these nesting of squares and circles along a central axis, was very um, heavy handed in shaping the possible activities of the space. So what I heard was that there was a need for kind of a greater range of scale of activation, different points of attention. So different things could happen at the same time. And also, so there could be kind of more intimate gatherings of political discussion. So the intervention that I proposed and designed um, basically kind of broke open that existing geometry, kept riffing on the circles, the squares, the triangles, um, but use those geometries to kind of intersect and carve out um, new fragmented spaces so that there are smaller scale of spaces for gathering. Um, and at that upper level, a space of real kind of attraction um, where people can come together um, and have discussions. Oops. So here you can see the, the realized piece. Um, it was created with custom fabricated steel frames and then these custom woven textiles, uh, these panels that were suspended between them. And the textiles were actually created by um, Powerhouse Arts in Brooklyn. They were handmade, hand knotted, um, and they're macrame knots, which you might know from like domestic craft. Uh, and that was very intentional because um, it was a celebration of a technique of making that we associate with the domestic sphere. Um, that brings associations of kind of familiarity, intimacy, a sort of soft tactility. Um, and I was interested in applying that to a kind of monumental scale and in the public realm, breaking down that division between public and private. It was also a celebration of a kind of making that's been um, labeled as women's work. So what happens when that is kind of celebrated publicly rather than um, held within domestic space? And it created a super tactile kind of interactive material that people could climb on and crawl on, lean on, um, and also you know, serve to kind of broaden that understanding of the civic to include these spaces of intimacy, of relaxation, and of play and softness. And in addition um, to kind of serve the purpose of political participation, I collaborated with um, Bartholomew County Indivisible on a series of events, um, such as this one on the opening day called We the People, which was a moment for people to share their hopes for democracy in their city. Um, and it's a town that does have some political polarization. So it was intentionally a kind of bipartisan event for people to share quotes and ideas and poems and even performances and songs about what they thought their government could be. Um, and it was, you know, it was a, a process that I think was really fruitful for opening up this space of governance and making it feel accessible and truly participatory. I'm going to share really quick a video of that event, just a one minute video. Here at RC Watch, sunset. Gates shall stand a mighty woman 
with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. When we feel that that river is our river, when we know that this land is our land, only then will we take care of them, and only then will we be able to deal with those problems. We will never have to build a great wall, nor will we ever have to draw a curtain, iron or other. work that improves the quality of life, but this type of work is the cornerstone of human dignity. And because people are important, working for people, even sacrificing a little bit of them, a little bit for them, brings much meaning to one's life. So that work was very much about responding to tangible heritage you know, buildings that sort of carry the histories and the values of a place. Um, but other work that I do is more about responding to intangible heritage or living histories, things like um, traditions of, of performance, uh, ways of occupying space, being in community, which are just as important for the sense of community and identity, um, but are often not as protected and preserved the way that architecture can be. Um, and are also just as important for defining public space. So I had an opportunity to kind of work on those themes um, through a project called Marching On, which was a collaboration with um, Mabel Wilson, who's an incredible scholar and designer who also teaches at Columbia. Um, and we were asked to collaborate on a project by Storefront for Art and Architecture um, that was specifically about the history of Black marching performances in New York City and really in America more broadly, um, looking at the way that marching can bridge between celebratory performance and also political protest and how many different things it has meant in the public realm over time. Um, so we had this opportunity to um, start with a research phase, looking at this history of marching uh, learning a lot from the Schomburg Center archives in Harlem, um, and looking at the way that marching bands actually originated through military marching bands and then became sort of transformed into mediums of expression and also part of a process of political protest and really asserting rights to public space. Um, and in this process, we also began a collaboration with the Marching Covers of New York, who are a drum line and a dance line based in Harlem, um, and have a very full schedule of performances throughout the country, really. Um, and with them, we started to think about how could we kind of reinterpret that history of marching for um, the contemporary space of Harlem, and particularly Marcus Garvey Park, which is a park right in the middle of Harlem, that's a kind of contested site. Um, it's surrounded by buildings that are rapidly gentrifying, but it's been a historic space of gathering for the black community there and an important place of performance and drum circles and many forms of celebration. So we wanted to find a way to kind of continue and celebrate that history with a contemporary interpretation that was also site specific. Um, so Mabel and I organized a series of workshops where we shared that research with the performers from um, the Marching Cobras and talked with them about, you know, what it meant to them and what their responses were to this history, whether they felt it was relevant to their experience. And then with them started to think about how to kind of occupy the space of the park. Um, that process of collaboration led to this performance, which was a specific reference to both the Silent March of 1917 and the Harlem Hellfighters, who were a famous military regiment from Harlem. So you can see the kind of army uniforms referenced here, and the white is a reference to the Silent Parade, which was a civil rights protest. So the performance sort of wove together these different historical references, but it was also very much a celebration of the Marching Cobras choreography and their kind of contemporary flair. Um, so it was really a kind of fusion of the past and the present. Um, and the, the uh, sort of capes that you see them wearing are this custom textile that we designed, which is referencing both the paving pattern within Marcus Garvey Park and also military camouflage because we were sort of exploring that relationship between 
the roots of marching in military marching bands and how it had been transformed and reinterpreted over time. So from that performance, um, we designed this exhibition that gathered the historical research as well as documentation of their performance. So in the back, you can see the kind of black and white that was the historical materials from the 19th century, and then it moves towards the present um, ending with the performance. And you can see here how the camouflage was a graphic motif um, that also became the kind of um, the borders and the cropping of these historical images throughout um, with the idea that um, there was a kind of play of visibility and invisibility throughout all of these histories of claiming public space, but also facing all these obstacles to being able to fully occupy and celebrate identity and community in public space. Um, so I'm going to share real quick a clip from a video. Oops. So you can hear a little bit more about this project. Just a couple minutes. To be Black and to be in public these days, walk on a sidewalk, you know, is often seen as a threat. What are the politics of African-American marching groups claiming public space in the United States, particularly at a moment of increasing militarization and surveillance? I think this is a really important moment to kind of think about what is that history of the march? What is it around these drill teams? And why are these young African-American dressed in these military costumes and throwing guns in the air? Marching was a way of actually creating public articulations of identity and of solidarity in the face of discrimination and inequality and lack of opportunities. I was invited to collaborate with Bryony by Storefront by Ava Frank, who had seen um, Bryony's performance in, in Chicago. Uh, I thought, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, particularly in terms of relationships of Black bodies in public space. We really wanted this project to emerge from the process of collaboration. So we didn't go in with a fixed idea of what the performance would be. We went in with the idea that we would have a series of workshops in which we would learn about the performers. The Marching Cobras are a drum line and dance line. They're an amazing organization whose mission is really to bring you together, to enlighten them about different forms of performance, dance, drumming. We like to show off different types of dance, so majorette, ballet, martin, and we like to show off our flexibility, so leg lifts, splits, and drops. It takes them off the street, but in, a, in an odd way, it puts them back on the street, but with a different agenda. I'm going to stop it there, um, but there's a lot of great quotes from the performers themselves. So um, if you want to see more, it's on my website. Um, so yeah, the um, after the exhibition was put up, it also became a site for more performances and more discussions about um, what marching means in New York City. And so this was... Um, you know, an opportunity to sort of have the research, the exhibition design, the performance continuously sort of feed into each other and create new opportunities for discussion. Um, and Mabel and I were also can sort of continued to do research and writing on this topic to kind of unpack what performance can mean for public space and architecture and why that's actually a, can be a very impactful medium to rethink our expectations for public space. And then the last theme I'll touch on is um, sensory public. So you saw in the last project already an interest in, you know, embodied experience, particularly through performance and the way that um, how we physically occupy public space can change our sense of empowerment or not in that space. Um, and that sort of interest in bodies and movement and experience continued um, with my recent work as well. Um, and there's been a sort of added layer for me of interest in neurodiversity, 
which is uh, refers to the infinite variety of human brains um, and the range of sensory processing. So it's a term that often describes um, people with developmental disabilities, such as autism, but can often describe changes in experience through mental illness, such as anxiety or depression or PTSD. Um, because all of these things actually affect our sensitivity to things like light and sound and social interaction, um, what it takes to make us feel at ease. And so um, I think in the wake of the pandemic, it's been particularly important to think about the sensory dimension of public space um, as so much more trauma has been experienced by so many people, so much trauma and loss. Um, and so I think it's an important moment to kind of bring in this layer as we think about creating truly inclusive um, public spaces. So one project on that theme that I did that opened last summer um, was at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. And it was a commission project um, just to activate that space. And so I sort of explored that, that theme of um, not just accessibility, but what's beyond accessibility. What could be a space where everybody feels like they can, they can truly play and have joy? Um, and so I worked closely with a huge range of um, community partners in Atlanta um, shown here. Um, so it was organizations representing people with both physical disabilities, but also intellectual disabilities um, to think about, you know, often there's so many limited options um, and they're often quite segregated. There'll be specific spaces for people with disabilities. And what's really needed is much more kind of integration and connection and social contact so that um, that segregation isn't reinforced further by architecture and design. Um, and so together we sort of talked about what would make a space um, accessible and exciting um, for people with a range of abilities. And the, um, the kind of common themes that came out was that, you know, tactile, interactive, highly multi-sensory experiences can be both exciting for people and can also offer productive kind of challenge. Uh, for example, for blind visitors, having something with textures that change over the course of the surface or things with changing height or things that move um, can offer kind of fun and productive challenges for navigation and exploration, particularly when you're thinking about kids um, who are in different stages of development. Um, and similarly, you're thinking about designing a space that is fun for kids with autism. Um, is, is so important to have a range of sensory experiences so that people can find a space that's quiet and peaceful if that's what they want in that moment, or a space that is really social and active and much more intense in terms of sensory stimulation. So the goal of the project was to think about a sensory maze. Um, and there were many kind of different design iterations of how to create a maze that would have different degrees of density and, and intensity. Um, using a kind of simple and affordable set of ingredients. Um, so I explored this form that was kind of, you know, a curving form that would lead to a little pocket of space and how that could be aggregated to create these a range of different densities throughout the site. And you can see here that, oops, skipped one, um, that then in section, the forms were sort of um, a butterfly effect or a sloping slice that would create different variations within each of these sort of shell spaces so that each pocket would have a different quality to it. And there would be a kind of overall, um, you know, uh, arc to the form. So you can see here that sort of overall shape and then how it had the different degree of, of density of elements and of different sensory stimuli in each of the spaces. So here's a shot of, of one of those moments. Um, you can see there are a lot of different components. That was part of the goal. Um, many different kinds of stimulation that people could choose to kind of opt in or opt out of. Um, but again, to think about those, those textures that could be really tactile and interactive, the, um, the canopy up above, and then the sort of harder surface underneath are a custom um, kind of gradient of teardrop shapes that change throughout the, the sort of sweep of that curve. So for blind visitors, you know, touching and sort of discovering that variation of shapes 
would be, you know, a stimulating experience. And then um, those those hanging, um, uh, it's webbing actually, webbing that's like backpack straps um, that changes in height. So it also becomes a sort of changing datum um, for navigating and understanding the enclosure. Um, and of course, kids use this in ways that we could never imagine, you know, sort of running and jumping and hanging and swinging on all these things, which is always what happens with, with anything in public space. And it's wonderful to see. And thank God it all <laughs> held up and uh, it all worked out. Um, but you can see here from above also how that um, combination of sort of uh, lower elements along the ground plane and then the, the changing canopy up above create these different pockets of space, some which are more enclosed than others. And some of the different interaction with the project. It was really fun to watch, um, you know, both in person and then from a distance on social media, how people interacted with the space. And some of the, the groups who were the community partners also came back um, to visit and explore the space as well. And that research led directly into um, the restorative ground project, which I worked on with, um, this is, this is realized at the same time, the summer of 2021 um, in lower Manhattan. And I worked on this with the WIP collaborative that Jackie mentioned. So this is a feminist collaborative that was formed in 2020 during the pandemic. And we originally formed as a larger community as kind of a support system. The WIP stands for Women in Practice and Work in Progress. And it was a way to share resources and, you know, references, find supportive or at least, um, you know, contractors that would be, you know, supportive and, and good to work with, um, things like that. And then seven of us started to work together more closely at first on a research project. Uh, we were all interested in this theme of neurodiversity and mental wellness and we started to conduct interviews, just self-initiated research and community engagement to try to understand how the public realm could become more inclusive with attention to kind of sensory issues. Um, and we started to kind of gather precedents and also feedback from these interviews with self-advocates. So people with autism, um, family members of people with autism, but also people of different ages, because a lot of time public spaces are, there's spaces for kids, and then there's like really boring plazas for adults, and it neglects big swaths of the population. So older folks, um, people with really little kids, teenagers. So we spoke to people of all ages to kind of understand what could make public spaces feel more inclusive for everybody. And you'll notice that we heard a lot about this, the importance of this range of um, sensory options. So having these calm spaces of retreat, as well as sort of heightened sensation, moments of social interaction and, and intensity and even political participation. So we had an opportunity to start to implement some of this research with a project called Restorative Ground. Um, and it was for this sort of burgundy rectangle area here in lower Manhattan on the west side. And it was commissioned by Urban Design Forum and the Hudson Square Business Improvement District to try to bring people back to this part of the city, which is primarily office buildings. So during the pandemic, it was really vacant and quiet. So they wanted to activate the street and also connect to these many institutions nearby, which primarily are for children and young people. So we sort of condensed our research findings into the idea of having three zones, that there would be a focus zone that could support office workers or people working from home that want a place to work outside, um, an active zone for kids that could be more interactive, and then a calm zone for kind of peaceful, restorative experiences. And, you know, this was during the pandemic, we were collaborating on Zoom and on Miro and just sort of sharing a lot of sketches about how to create a modular system that with shapes that would define these kind of distinct experiences and create um, the difference between an active zone and a calm zone, for example. And we landed on this um, form here, which is overall a kind of wedge that, that slopes down to the sidewalk and forms a barrier on the other side to the traffic. 
And we have these three zones, the sort of focused, active, and calm. And each one has a, a sort of accent element. So the big tables for the focus zone, um, the peak, the playscape peak with artificial turf for the active zone, and then um, this sort of lounge hammock for the calm zone. And um, you can see here a sense of the modular design. Um, the forms here were in eight by eight grids. And that was important to us because during the pandemic, we wanted to have little pockets of space where people could feel like there was a sort of implied zone that could be their zone, um, but they would still be visually connected to other people and there would be a sense of kind of overall coherence. Um, and the sort of materiality of all this was really important to us as well. So um, you can see here the artificial turf and then there's recycled rubber grating. Each area has a really tactile um, kind of inviting uh, material to play with. And the way it's been used has been really lovely. It's still there. Um, it's being resurfaced now so that it can continue on. And um, it's this real sort of slice of life in New York. So people come from the office buildings, from the construction sites to come eat lunch at the tables. There's people bringing their kids to play, skateboarders going up and down the ramps. Um, it's really wonderful to see the, the kind of mixing that happens in this place. Um, and you know, all of that was, you know, it was really the most important goal, but we also had fun thinking through the kind of detailing of this project and doing things like keeping existing trees and bringing in enough light and water for them that they could still thrive, even with the project above them. Um, and also kind of playing with materials, alternative materials for public space that would make it more soft and inviting and um, again, have a kind of domestic feel to the space. And we did commission um, a post-occupancy study of this space so that we could understand you know, how the different forms were working and to really you know, recognize that it's the life after the project is built that is the most important. So how do we kind of understand that better um, and use that to inform future design? So then just the last note I'll touch on and then I'll wrap up um, is just a project that is coming soon that kind of brings together all these themes of, you know, an existing site, uh, these living histories and a sort of sensory experience, uh, which is a new permanent public space project that's gonna be built in Toledo, Ohio. And it's the glass city known for glass production and also glass artisanship. Um, and the project will be this field of glowing glass orbs on stainless steel stalks. Um, each one of which contains um, an object that references um, an element in the history of Toledo. So key to this is a process of community participation in which people um, bring objects that are important to them and the history of Toledo. And we record these stories sort of explaining these objects and sharing this range of histories from industrial production to artisan techniques to kind of personal everyday objects. Um, and they will be, the objects, images of them will be laser engraved as 3D shapes within these glass spheres and illuminated to create this sort of feel that one explores within um, a new park facing downtown Toledo. So it'll be a kind of beacon from downtown um, drawing you across the river. Okay, and I'm gonna to stop to make sure we have time for discussion and questions, but um, that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bryony. Um, yeah. Yeah. Students here. It's nice. um, Brainy, thank you so much. Um, I'm sort of processing in my mind as I'm speaking. I have lots of different ki kinds of questions for you. Um, uh, from things, um, so I'll, I'll put a couple of uh, um, things on the table. Um, I mean, obviously, one of the biggest takeaways from, I think, 
your one of the big takeaways for me in um, and also I'm thinking uh, about our uh, audience of the students in, in relationship to kind of reading your work and hearing you talk about it is um, the kind of the process of community engagement that is a like it's, it's as if um, like it, you talked about it as kind of an expanded set of tools, right? Like, like there's ways that we draw, there's ways that we maybe can, can kind of read and kind of contextualize what we're doing. And then there's this other really important piece which you're describing, which is uh, uh, talking to people, <laughs> like, and, and trying to identify like who, who are those people that you begin to talk to and what are the different ways? Like I would imagine that process is not the same in every given project. And, and maybe in ones that are very specific, like commissioned work, uh, there may be very clear ideas about who you speak, one would want to speak to. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit, kind of the way an architect, and I, I know how much you love drawing, like kind of the way that like an insider kind of conversation, but like when we draw, we're like, we know what it means to like think about line weights and line types and ways of represent, representing like and shading and hatching and all these, like what is that? in relationship to community engagement and the process, like what, what are the fine grained sort of nuances of, um, of that as a tool? Um, and what, how are you learning that? And how could you maybe share that a little bit with our, with the, with the students? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I think that's the, I've heard, I, I got some great feedback recently on a lecture I gave that like people want to see more process. Mm -hmm. And I tried to bring some of that in, but I feel like that should be its own lecture maybe. <laughs> Because I think your question, um, I mean, it gets to something that, that I really value, and I think you do as well in your work, which is this understanding of the interplay between these two kinds of content, that they're both really important, that um, the, the kind of formal and technical tools that we have as architects are extremely important. It's a very valuable kind of expertise. And then so is this capacity to be able to talk to people who are not architects and, and hear about their everyday lives, like to really absorb that information, find a way of documenting it and making it part of the process. Um, and they are very different things, mm -hmm. very different types of skills. Um, I think often, or maybe more historically, when people heard about socially driven design, there was an assumption that like, oh, well, it's not, it's not about design, it's just designed by committee, or it's going to be ugly, or it's just, you know, ready made things thrown together. Um, and I think more and more, you're seeing um, people who are really trying to do design and community engagement at the same time, that, that both are equally um, valuable. Um, but it does get tricky in terms of of authorship and decision making, right? Because you want it to feel like it's a collaboration from the beginning. And I think it becomes about, well, what kind of content are people bringing to the table? Everyone's bringing something. Um, like Mabel said to me once, like, well, everyone's bringing their own kind of expertise. And I think that's a really helpful way to look at it that, you know, as architects, we have very particular training and understanding what geometry can do in a space and how you know different forms of fabrication can make that possible or not um, but people who live somewhere have expertise about what that place is really like and what the problems are and what its histories are and what they want and as an architect you may have really no idea I mean you can read something you can like try to educate yourself and that's important to do but I think it's very important to understand that the expertise about a place and about a community's experience really lives with the people there. So it's sort of a question of how can you, how can you create a format, like a platform that will enable people to bring their expertise to the table and you to bring your expertise. And then like those two things can come together. And it's been to the sort of insider question of like, well, what's the format? What's the platform? Um, it has been different for every project. Um, and I think, um, I'm trying to think about what would be like a good example. The performance ones are actually the easiest because, you know, being in a space with your body is something that we can all do, the designers and the performers. And then the performance can kind of lead that process by saying, well, what if we do this? Or what if we do this? Or this space makes me feel like this. And then, you know, as the designers, we can kind of listen to that and say, well, okay, maybe in terms of how we respond to this space, you know, what if we pick up some cues from like this axis here and this pattern on the ground and the, the organization of the trees? So that's, 
in a way, the performance is like the easiest platform of exchange, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, But in other ways, I think there's a little bit more like with built stuff. I think there's a process of, for me, it's like listening first, like hearing as much as you can from people who are the client or the stakeholders about what they want somewhere, like understanding the values, the priorities, the problems, listening, taking notes, like mapping that out for yourself. And then thinking about, okay, well, what kind of, you know, structure or form is going to be responsive to some of these things? And I usually offer like a set of options, you know, and then, and a kind of range of things and then see which they respond to. Mm -hmm. And then we go from there. Um, And sometimes it's helpful. I mean, it's a little old school, but I think thinking about typologies, like, is it, you know, the form of like an agora, a place where, you know, people can come together. Is it sort of like that type of thing? Is it the form of a table where people can come together? Is it more of a stage? So there's sort of like basic spatial elements that that anyone can understand. Like you say stage to people, like, oh yeah, I know what that does. But then you reinvent the stage so that it's doing something else that's responding to the site in a different way or like, eliminating the hierarchy of stage or something, you know? So I think finding some of those sort of spatial elements that can be a common language can be really helpful. Does that make sense? Can, yeah, it does. And, and um, like, for instance, in the project you did at the, I think it was the, ooh, where was it in? Uh, it was the, the, it was the, it was the, yeah, the Columbus one, uh, the, not the most recent one, the one that you did with the, um, the SOM building or the, you mm-hmm. know, the, that, 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 and that, and that plaza, you identified an organization that you thought was somehow kind of had an important, like held an important set of values that you were interested in. Was that a part of your, like, is that was something that you authored in the sense that you like, I want this to be a, an important voice for, as a public that I want to engage with, or is that something that came with, let's say the the, the the brief of the project, right? So like, I'm just curious about how, you know, even identifying who it is that you're going to be listening to, mm-hmm. right? Seems like a really Im- kind of um, important um, uh, kind of moment of agency in trying to elevate or trying to identify who, what voices will be be a part of the conversation. Who are the stakeholders, right? Just people who are paying for it or like, how do you identify that? I'm wondering, you know, I'm just curious, like how, what that, navigating that is and what where you're seeing opportunities um, in the way that kind of n- voices can be brought in. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the main political move is yeah. identifying the stakeholders. Yeah. And usually in a project saying, we should talk to stakeholders. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because a lot of times that was not that was not asked for in these projects. I mean, some of like obviously marching on that was key, but uh, with the city hall one, it wasn't. It was just respond to this building. Right. Um, and so then, you know, it then for me, it was like, okay, who, who cares about this space? Who uses the space? What is like civic mean to people and who like wants to be participating more? Um, And then, so then identifying those people to participate in the process is the kind of political move. Yeah. But I think that's a, that's something I always encourage students to push because like community engagement is not going to be a required part of the process most of the time. And it does take time. And ideally people support that, like a client supports that with funding and with time. Sometimes they don't. And so um, it's sort of your choice as a designer, how much you are going to do that work and like really kind of talk to people and understand. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great question. Uh, thank you, Bryony, for coming. Like, yeah. Your question, because I think um, maybe his mic's not too far away. But I was thinking about um, maybe the, the students who are doing thesis and um, trying to figure out not just maybe what something looks like, but how one works on something. And I and I guess like that seems like the biggest. Maybe if I had to kind of come to one of the lessons of your of your um, your lecture today is like how one works is as much maybe a part of as a design project as how one as a thing that one makes to some extent Mm -hmm. um and 
I was thinking like it seems like when you're talking about sites, there's like, it seemed like there were parallel sites in my own mind. There's the site between the studio and then the place. Um, and then there's the kind of site um, which maybe was, uh, involves like just architecture at large, like sort of let's shift maybe discussions in architecture elsewhere. So bringing, um, you know, the performance uh, of a marching band uh, to Mies or to storefront or to places that are architecturally relevant places um, seems to be a way to bring, let's say, things that maybe are not currently in the world of architecture into for an audience of, of architects, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and so one question that came to me was maybe uh, the difference between public and audience. It seems like some of the work, some of it at least, maybe the audience is, is maybe the world of architecture, I don't know, or art, or I don't know. Um, and as much as some of it uh, is uh, asking us to think of uh, of maybe research, right? So I, you know, one thing I think when we think of community engagement or we think of talking to people, I think these are like listening, asking questions. These are, these are, it's a different way to do research than going to the library, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and for thesis, I think it's kind of, the question of research is always important, like what kind of research one would do. Um, uh, and so I don't know, like I wanted to, I don't know if these are like fair characterizations, you think, Bryony? Because like the thing that's, there's a lot of like pre like other examples of like architects doing research and the way that they think of sites like uh, the most obvious maybe is like Denise Scott Brown Venturi going to Vegas but they don't do a thing in Vegas they produce maybe a book um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking you know you're probably your colleague at Columbia Andreas Hockey's idea of entanglements of sites but that's maybe more his specific interest is like the material lo logistical histories of a site um, maybe that's not a, necessarily about going and talking to communities but it's about you know, I don't know, research of like a specific material or something like this. Um, but it, so it, it seems like what you're doing is a little bit different than either of those two examples. And I'd be curious maybe what um, what architects or artists you look to in terms of like that kind of practice, a kind of engaged practice. There's probably more artists that we can think of than architects. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I guess maybe my, my, I don't know, these are points, I guess. But maybe the question here is more, um, how do you, would you speak to maybe this behind me? I don't know if you can see them. Oh, yeah, <laughs> camera, right here. Okay. Um, like an audience of students that are starting thesis, they've done thesis prep, which ostensibly is research, but I was, to me, it seems like thesis and thesis prep are both design and research. Um, I'd be just curious, like how this idea of, let's say, authoring your own way of producing research, whether that's the way that you work in your practice or, or, or other, like how that has, um, maybe evolve for you, like why you came to these methods or um, uh, people that have come before you that you've been kind of interested in who've done who've done this kind of work or who are parallel to you? I don't know. Yeah, I love that question. And it's also like you you really you see me <laughs> because I think there is a <laughs> yeah. there's definitely like a disciplinary project and then there's like the actual project in the space. Um, and I think it's super relevant for thesis, that question, because um, when, I, when I was in thesis um, at Princeton, it was all about the disciplinary project. Like you had to articulate what is your project? How are you trying to change the field? And who are you in alignment with? And who are you critical of? Um, and so I think that that has always been at the back of my head as something an important way to work in a way um and your question to research is is like right on the yeah right at the heart of it because for me it's about um forms of knowledge basically kind of epistemological question that my agenda i guess would be to say that there are forms of knowledge that i think are essential to architecture that are not really discussed as much, which is basically the knowledge that we have as embodied humans going through the world, experiencing buildings in these everyday kind of banal ways that are imbued with social relationships, with cultural histories, with our own internal psychological states, and like that interplay between the super personal intimate and then the, you know, the built and how that starts to aggregate into community experiences and like experiences of a historical moment. I think 
those are really important kinds of information in understanding how to make architecture. But it takes to, to sort of gather that knowledge takes a totally different set of tools than, um, like you said, researching in a library. So that's exactly the question that drives a lot of the of the work is like, how do we understand sensation? How do we understand social experience? And it's really kind of this grab bag for me of, um, of other disciplines. And I think actually urban design and urban planning have um, gone a lot farther than architecture, you know, in this direction. Um, so Justin Garrett Moore, who is an urban planner, urban designer, um, teaches at Columbia has been really helpful for me in, um, sharing the kind of methods of urban planners, which is all about maybe because they don't have the assumption that they are designers. <laughs> they don't assume to know like how to solve the problem ahead of, ahead of time. Um, it's this sort of, you know, um, toolkit of ways of learning from people about a place. And it's like taking a walk with someone through a place and asking them to tell you about it or, you know, recording oral histories or having people map a space you know, all these different ways of tapping into this fundamentally intangible kind of knowing. Um, and so that's certainly um, a driver for the work. And there are really interesting, you know, artists, like you said, you know, who do this kind of work. Um, Mary Miss is doing some work along these lines, um, has always been kind of involved in land art and public space. Um, there's a whole world of social practice art, some of which, is more or less interested in like, you know, the politics of communities. Um, and, and so I think that that for sure is my disciplinary agenda. And you're right that that is for that agenda is more for the audience of, of architects and, you know, planners and historic preservationists. And at the same time, hopefully the specific work is, really, you know, meaningful for the people on the ground who are, you know, experiencing it firsthand. Um, did I answer your question? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, uh, there seems to, there's also a sort of desire in the work to some extent that like the process of making it is also on display. And I think, you know, you're mm. talking about more process, but it almost seems like uh, uh, there would be a version of conceptual art, like um, where the artists would like do the work in the gallery. Mm -hmm. That's not, you, there's still a, like maybe a separation in your work of like the office or studio from the place, but you are present in the maybe the research or in these performances. You're in the background of the photo. But the, <laughs> um, sometimes, but you know, and then there's and then the work, like the installations, are still a thing separate from from you working. So it seems like there's a kind of, um, just trying to think of like the, the image of, that's sort of produced, at least here on, on the screen, there's like the, the, still a distinction maybe between the work and the research, but it seems like the research is as much a part of the work as the physical things. I don't know, this is not a question we should let student. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, but I think the question of representing the process is something that I need to do more with. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I know that there's a couple of students that I mean, there's there's a couple of students I'm working out with specifically working on, on the public realm and also, um, yeah, the question of public publics with an S, um, and the way kind of kind of yeah public space, uh, yeah the maybe hostility of public space in LA, like the, you know, some questions about that. I don't know whether or not anybody wants to be brave enough to like share some stuff or talk about stuff. Yeah, Karen? Yeah, come on up. Oh yeah, it's totally fine. I'm flexible. I'm muting myself because the church bells in the neighborhood are really loud. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Karen, and right now I'm working on my thesis. Uh, it's about how to improve the walking system in the Los Angeles city. And, and uh, first, I'm considering about the homeless on the street and how they 
Mm, and their uh, living conditions is very uh, worse right now, and how we can improve the uh, street conditions for those vulnerable people. And also, uh, this matter, I also uh, think about how to create a, a shading system for the city. Like it, it's not, uh, it's not a only, it's not only uh, support the homeless to to kind of like create a shelter for them and also can benefit all the people who live in the city, who are um, working on the city. So, and, 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 and I, I really like your project I talked about uh, today. And I, I have a question about the, the, the orange one, uh, uh, the, the last one, I think. Uh, I, I want to ask, uh, is that, uh, is that uh, an installation can fix anywhere? Uh, did you ever consider um, uh, this installation can work for the uh, different group of people in the city, like uh, homeless or different uh, kind of vulnerable people in the in the city? Like, uh, is it is this uh, facilities can be used can be used? at different wear on the street. Yeah, yeah, just like, like this picture I showed. So, uh -huh. uh, so I'm focusing on the different gap spaces in the urban, like very small spaces, and how we can insert some, some sort of uh, in infrastructure or some sort of a facility in, in there and trying to improve the, um, improve the condition of the street. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I think it's super smart to think about kind of multi-purpose units that can, can serve many different populations. I mean, that's often um, the key to getting something done in public space is to show that it can help a lot of different people. Um, but I think you're also smart to think about um, creating these sort of small scale pockets of, of support and sanctuary and, and home um, for, for people who are living on the street, because um, I'm not an expert in homelessness and homelessness you know, policy, but um, I know that for some people, some people would prefer to be in a shelter and some people really would not. Um, and so creating like the option of a comfortable sleeping space that feels protected uh, seems really smart. And to do that in a, in a distributed way, I think is great. We, um, for the project you're asking about, we had, um, we, we actually, the intention is that afterwards it will be broken down and moved to different neighborhoods in throughout New York City um, to communities that want it. Um, I'm hoping that will still happen. It, you know, it's funded by a private entity. And so, um, you know, it depends on their goodwill in kind of funding that transformation. Um, but certainly it is a comfortable sleeping, lying, lounging space. So it would definitely, you know, kind of support those uses. Um, and it's currently in a, you know, a very heavily trafficked area. And it also is connected to a building that owns the space. So they have a security guard. So it's not currently, you know, supportive of people um, sleeping there overnight. But the forums certainly could be in other settings. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Ryan, I think it brings up also interesting questions about um, ideas of specificity, um, maybe like m maybe a, a maybe push pull between um, like the prototype versus the kind of specific is, you know, um, and if, if those things yeah, are attention in the work or as well as let's say the generic and the specific, it seems like you've you take the side of the specific over the generic in certain, let's say, um, uh, and, and that being a kind of an important um, kind of value in the way that you're working. Um, but I, I wonder whether there's also a, a conversation around the open, open ideas of open-endedness um, as versus, um, versus the, the, like, there seems to be an idea about open-endedness different than, maybe that's different than, let's say, the, like the generic or the kit. Mm -hmm. Right there, there are there seems like there's a territory of uh, of 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 the way in which you are working with these kind of uh, large scale kind of public furniture components that are 
somehow both open-ended, um, but not, let's say, generic, right? Right. Um, yeah. yeah, that's great. But there's a lot of power in the generic, like distributed sort of more systems models, yeah. I think, like what you're describing with this project, that, 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 has, a, that has a capacity for agency at a bigger scale mm. than something that is highly site-specific, which, you know, yeah, is important to me for sort of cultural specificity reasons, but I think there's a lot of power in uh, imagining a system mm -hmm. as well. Cool. Yeah. It's nice to see some of the work. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you, Brani. Mm -hmm. Is there any, anyone else have a question? Well, Bryony, that was so wonderful. Um, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your work with us and enlightening us with your process of thinking and, and all of the kind of super kind of interesting um, impacts that you've um, put into place into all of these public spaces. Um, I hope that we can have you back maybe for final reviews. We'll see. <laughs> I'll send you the dates and we can see if we can work, work that out. Um, thank you again. Um, and thank you such to a the pleasure. students for joining us today. Um, great. And thank you to Mira. Thank you. David. It's so nice to see you all again. It's been too long. And yeah, so nice to be back even virtually. So thank you, Bryony. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Take care.